Hey there, I'm Guy, you're watching Midwinter Minis, and today I'm going to show you how to use a faulty product to get awesome results. Back when the Army Painter put out their new Speed Paint range, a set that rivaled the performance of Citadel's Contrast Paint line at a fraction of the price, it started a big old controversy here on YouTube. If you apply a wash or a very moist layer of paint over something painted with speed paints, they could reactivate it, making the colours mix and ruining the effect you were going for. Full disclosure, I'm not getting paid by anyone to make this video, except our lovely Patreon supporters. No paint company sponsors me or is affiliated with me, and while I can appreciate that having your paint not behave in the way you expected it to might be pretty annoying, on this channel I like finding uses for everything. Whether that's texture paints on your models, toothpaste in your paintbrushes, or used coffee on your bases, and I'm going to show you how to easily achieve these striking results by intentionally reactivating the army painters speed paints. This Imperial Guard Lehman Russ battle tank will be the perfect thing to try to use this technique on. Lots of large flat armour panels, which if you use speed paints or contrast paints as suggested, they will look kind of blotchy and weird. Before we begin, let's drill out the barrels. It's totally optional, obviously, but I'm going to use this in a battle report soon and I want it to look nice. I'm going to use the colour called Occultist Cloak for the armour. In fact, I'm going to use all the same paints as I used in last week's video where I painted the Cadian Shock Troops as a Penal Legion and the Cold Calculating Commissar as a late 70s Brooklyn Pimp. Now because this is quite a dark colour, I'm going to dilute it quite heavily with the Speed Paint Medium and this will keep the behaviour of seeking out the crevices but make the surface staining less pronounced. I gave everything a good mix up, both by hand and using the Vortex mixer, and then mixed what I needed in a little cup. Probably about one part paint to two parts medium here. Now just using a big old brush, slop it on all over the place. Make sure to get it in all of the crevices, and make sure there's no gaps in the coverage. Once you've done that, immediately grab a bit of torn up sponge, either kitchen sponge, packing material, proper artist sponge, it doesn't really matter, and dab it at the surface to break up the tension and pulling together, pooling nature of the paint. Once you do that, leave it to dry for a few minutes. I lent mine up against this water pot so that the paint didn't pool downwards and rather stayed in position. Now, as soon as it looks dry, that is to say, isn't shiny anymore and isn't tacky to the touch, we can do the next stage. I'm intentionally not letting it wait the two hours that Army Painter recommends in between coats to let this stuff dry because I want the paint to reactivate. Paint on another layer of your thin paint, do the sponging again, and you're going to notice that some sections of the first paint layer start to lift with the aggravating action of the brush and the sponge. Now, don't freak out, this is all part of the plan. The recesses are going to stay dark because they're not being agitated, but some areas will start to develop random textures and patterns. We're going to use this happy accident effect to create a realistic weathered patina on the tank's armour plates. Here's what the second application looks like when it's dried. Dried for a few minutes, that is. Time for another layer. Three layers of thinned paint application and sponging to break up the pooling gives optimal results, as far as the effect I was going for. I did this on all of the other areas of the tank, and the good part about this technique is that because you're trying to create an imperfect finish, you don't have to worry about carefully painting each section without leaving tide marks as the edges dry, which is a constant consideration when you paint with contrast or speed paints in the usual way. Now, if you're in a mega hurry and you want to rush this along, you don't even have to wait for it to dry between steps. You can use a hairdryer to get things done even quicker without ruining the effect. This whole process has only taken me about half an hour so far. And now that step is out of the way, I'm going to apply a quick gloss varnish to everything to lock the texture in place. That's it for the happy accidents in this video. From now on, things are going to be a bit more controlled. Next up, I'm going to use AK White, the only non-speed paint in this whole video, to give everything a light dry brush. Catching the edges, accentuating prominent features, and adding a slightly dithering, softening effect to the flat areas of the armour. Then I'll use the same paint, but more precisely, to add highlights to the bottom edges of areas where the lighter paint has been exposed. This will hopefully make it look like the many layers of paint that this old beaten up tank has had applied are peeling away. This is a Lehman Rust that's been relegated to a prison planet after all. Next up, I'm going to use the new Broadsword Silver Speed Paint to lay a coat down on the wheel mount points, the gun barrels, the tracks, and the vents. I then used Hoplite Gold on the Aquilas and Imperial Insignia, and then gave a few bonus areas a very thin coat of AK White, ready for the colour accents. 
My Penal Legion have very bright orange fatigues, so to match that colour I base coated with Ancient Honey, tapped it with a sponge to minimise the pooling effect of the speed paint, and then once that was properly dry I added a thin glaze of bright red over the top and gave that a sponging too. I used a combination of bony matter and noble skin on the bases of my penal troopers so it makes sense to use the same colours to add mud, dirt and dust to the armour and tracks of the tank too. Starting with thinned bony matter, the lightest colour, and being most generous with it. And then moving on to noble skin, diluted as it's a much stronger, darker colour, and applying it to smaller, more selective areas, and sponging off the excess between all of the coats. To highlight the orange, I added a bit of white paint to the bright red and ancient honey mix I used before, and this will add some opacity and make it behave more like a regular thinned paint glaze. And then one more glaze highlight using just the ancient honey yellow paint mixed with a bit of white, trying to keep my brush movements quite random and stipply rather than soft and flowing. Nice, that matches the weathered look of the model pretty well. I thinned some of the grim black speed paint very heavily with medium and used this as a kind of fine line shade to add some extra contrast in the creases and crevices where the models needed it, and also add an extra dimension to the cheaty, flaky paint look we've got going on on the flat surfaces. Now, can you use speed paints through an airbrush? Yeah, yeah you can. They go through airbrushes really well without diluting them. But more importantly, it's also really easy to do wet blend highlighting with these paints too. First coat the area in a speed paint you want to use, ancient honey in this case, and then with a tiny bit of white on your brush, gently tease it into the areas you want to be brighter while the speed paint is still wet. Looks pretty cool, huh? I then mixed a tiny bit of bony matter into the occultist cloak paint to warm up a bit, mixed in a bit of white paint to bump up the opacity, and then smoothed out a couple of areas on the armour where it looked a little bit too rough, maybe spoiled the illusion of the naturally flaking paint. Plus a bit of warm tonal variety will make things look a bit more realistic anyway. Now trying out something here, I mixed a tiny bit of white into the broadsword silver, and while it did dull down its shininess a bit, it looked passable as a subtle highlight on the gunmetal when I applied it to the top facing parts of the gun barrels. Not brilliant, but not terrible. I'd have preferred to use a brighter silver, but there's only one in this range, and I wanted to stick to the challenge I set myself. To finish off the model I applied a mix of transfers from the Shock Troop transfer set to the orange armour plates on the turret, some kill markers on the sponsons, and then gave those areas a lick of matte varnish to knock off the transfer shine. And boom! One heavily weathered prison planet Lehman Rust battle tank painted up in no time at all, using very simple but effective techniques and making the best of the materials at hand with a cheeky bit of innovation. And that is the epitome of what I try to do here on Midwinter Minis. And if you want to see more, please subscribe. And now both the Imperial Guard Start Collecting Box and the Slanesh Demon Start Collecting Box are all painted up and ready to battle it out in the Deathmatch Arena. Who do you think will come out on top? Let me know in the comments. If you want to see how I painted either of those armies or catch up on the Deathmatch tournament so far, check out the links in the video description. Now, if you'll indulge me for just a minute, this whole reactivation issue reminds me of a similar farce from the synth world. Now you obviously probably know me as a mini painting YouTuber, but before I made this my full time gig in 2020, I worked in pro audio in marketing and as a product demonstrator. That was my world. In 2015, polyphonic analog synthesizers were very, very pricey. But then, all of a sudden, a company called Akai came out of nowhere with the Tambor Wolf, a polyphonic analog sequencing synth for 400 quid. And people were crazy excited until they heard it. Now, even the guy who was paid to make people excited about it couldn't even pretend to like it. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Compared to the flagship polyphonic analog synths people were used to, it sounded weak, dull, didn't have a lot of tonal control, and despite its real simulated wood grain sides, real simulated wood grain sides, it didn't sell well. Which is a shame, because in hindsight, it's actually a very capable little machine, and used in the right context, being sympathetic to its tonal abilities and its limitations. It sounds great. Its affordability also gave people who wouldn't ordinarily have been able to afford analog synths the opportunity to do so. That's the parallel with what we have here in the mini painting world as I see it. Nothing is a perfect product. That's why I mix and match the stuff I use and encourage you to do the same. 
You need to experiment, have fun, make mistakes, and sometimes that means finding ways to make imperfect things work perfectly for you, if that makes sense. Long story short, worry less and paint more. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.